Hello and welcome along to another episode of this FM19 story, part of the furniture with me, Daniel. It's season 3, episode 6, and today I'm back to being negative and unhappy as our board have got to us yet again. Despite those negatives, which we will talk about in a minute, there are plenty of big things to look forward to on the positive side today. We've got a big game against our local rivals, Plymouth, or about as local as you can get down here. We're away to them in the first game at the start of today's episode. And then we've got what will hopefully be our first youth intake of the season in just under a week's time. But before we do the big finish on a positive note, let's get the negatives out of the way. Obviously, those of you that have been following the story will know this season's been an absolute roller coaster ride. We had the euphoria of beating Stevenage on a return to the league in the first game of the season. We then had a sticky spell for a couple of episodes, though we still had the little positives of the Checker Trade Trophy run, which ended against Arsenal in the last episode. We'd lost one of our best players after his release clause had been met, but it meant that we could get a youth recruitment and youth coaching in place so we could start to get intakes and develop our own players at the club. However, since then we've obviously had deadline day. I kind of wished I'd stayed to show you it on camera because you'd never believe what's happened. So let's go and have a look at the transfers. You can tell I'm not going to be happy to start with. We're still waiting for those two to come in at the end of the season and we're even more happy we've got Owen Jack now. The reason for that is as well as getting a few players in, most of them panic signings as a result of what we'd lost. Our board decided to accept an offer that was too good to refuse for Armando Broger, our star striker. They've already done this with Reese Williams last season, which although we didn't agree with, we were in financial trouble and I could understand the lure of it. We sold McDonald in this window and we went to secure financially, so why on earth they needed to sell one of our best players I don't know. 425000 up front, rising to a potential 1.1 million, though a lot of that's based on appearance fees and things he'll never get at the club. We have got the 40% sell on, so as soon as that becomes available we'll try and take it so we can make a profit out of it. But if we go and look at him, he was our 19-year-old Albanian striker. He was doing really well for us. He had 11 in 26 games in the league, and quite a few of those were off the bench too. Physically, he was very good, and he was just starting to develop technically and mentally, and was going to become a really good player. They put him straight on the loan list at West Brom, because the board didn't think to get a loan back clause, and he no longer wants to join us on loan as a result. We also let Jack Payne go, which was planned. He's gone to Boston United. He came back from his long injury, but physically he's off the mark now. And he's not really that good a player aside from his big long throw. And at 29 years of age, it wasn't a risk we could take for what was our joint highest paid player at the club. But despite that, we remember him fondly as a fantastic servant. 76 appearances, two goals, and I'm sure plenty more assists with his long throw. We also had a bit of a pickle in central midfield because Alex Hunt was recalled on deadline day by Sheffield Wednesday because he wasn't playing enough games. And obviously with Rowan McDonald going, he could have played more. But unfortunately it's not to be and we've had to panic on the last few days of the window. So on deadline day, we bought in a replacement striker for Brozier. He's not as good. He's going to be a backup or rotational option. He did score one in his first two games though. It's Joe Hardy, a two and a half star player. Four star potential from Brentford. He's only here till the end of the season. And looking at his stats, we won't be renewing it. He's probably fairly similar to Matt Foy, who's not been able to cut it at this level. So we're down to one good striker in Andrew Nelson. And then a lot of probably good National League players. Mikel Kennedy being the best of the bunch at the moment. The other one on deadline day was just to replace Sokolik and White. Obviously we got Grant in the youngster from Stoke, but we were still one option short of the back. So we went to our parent club again, Sunderland. They've given us Kane Evans. He's a three-star centre-half with five-star potential. He's good across the board physically and technically for what we need in defence anyway. But mentally, he's not quite there. So we're going to have him as a backup option for now. Obviously, our three other centre-halves are very good. But unfortunately, Platt's had a little bit of a wobbly off camera too. So he's now unhappy, meaning that Kane Evans is probably our first choice backup. So not one we'll use regularly, but he's here if we need him. And it just means in a case of crisis, we've got some good backup options. The last one is a free agent, and he's a bit of a surprise, really. He's a central midfielder. Obviously, we needed that to replace the three we'd lost in McDonald and Payne permanently, and then Alex Hunt being recalled. But Josh Laurent, he's a former player in the Football League with Shrewsbury Berry. He made one appearance for Wigan, and he's also played for Hartlepool, Brentford and Braintree. So he's got loads of experience at 25 years of age. 
but he's a box-to-box -box midfielder and he's pretty average across the board, apart from the fact he's got 17 for finishing. And I thought about retraining him as a striker. If he'd had a bit more pace, we could have done that. But he could be an absolute star for us. And to get him on a free for £700 a week, half the amount Payne was on for a player who's probably slightly better, is a really good signing for us. And again, he's worth 375000 So he's got that sell-on value if he does well for us too. And at 25, he's not one we'd mind losing. So that's the one positive out of the transfer window, but it's fair to say I'm a little bit annoyed. This is the first episode I'm recording since the start of Season 3 came out on YouTube, and a few of you said it was time to get in some young players with high potential and develop the side, which I completely agree with, a couple of years to consolidate and develop long term. But unfortunately I border trying to ruin that, as they keep selling on all the best ones after 6 months of service. But we'll of course continue with our policy, because it's the only way we can really afford to practice in profit at the moment, the other thing we've got to show you is the results quickly. There haven't been many since you were last with me, just the four or five. Four, in fact. So after that Arsenal game, we got absolutely battered at Cheltenham. Our away form's really gone down the drain since. Molyneux got a goal for us early in the second half, but it was a terrible performance and a terrible result. We then beat Cambridge at home 1-0. They're right down there near the bottom of the league. A Brad Walker goal separated the two sides. We weren't convincing, but we got the job done. And Davis and Pike were absolutely sensational at the back. We then went away to Lincoln and continued our poor form. They're up in 7th place at the moment, so we can't complain about that too much. Joe Hardy did get a late goal, a consolation, but his first for the club. But other than that, we didn't look like scoring all game. But against Peterborough home in the last match, another side up in the playoffs, Andrew Nelson was the hero with a brace, as we won 2-0 and kept ourselves in with an outside sniff of the playoffs. Though I suspect with our squad weakening over January, we won't be able to sustain that now. So if we go and look at the table, we're still in 10th place, remarkably just a point off the playoffs, but we're also sliding towards the bottom as well. We're only 9 points away from 19th, which would probably be a slightly disappointing season at this stage, but I have to stick with what I said at the start, particularly with our board taking control of transfers against our will in this save. We already suffer with that on the head coach, we don't need it here too, but if we can finish above the relegation zone, we've done our job, but it would be nice if we could hang on to a comfortable position. We do owe a huge debt of gratitude to that 10-game period we had in November and December. In those 10 games, we picked up 28 points, 9 wins and a draw. We had a draw either side of those as well, but in the other 24 games, we've only picked up 25 points. So it's relegation form for the majority of the season, but that one good run is the thing that's taken us all the way up away from the relegation zone and into the top half as it stands at the moment. But we have shown signs that we're back to our normal form, so it could be a tricky and disappointing end to the season. But we've got a big local rivalry to look forward to today. It's something Torquay fans haven't had for a little while because we've been out of the Football League and Plymouth have been all the way up in League One. You can see their slight favourites for it. They won the game at our place earlier in the season and we hope we can make amends for that today. We're not quite at full strength because Andrew Nelson's got a knock, which means we've got two National League quality strikers up front together who haven't really played together much either. Apart from that, we're fairly familiar. We've got Bassing goal, Human Pike are the fullbacks with Byrne and Davis in the middle, Tom Walker and Freeman are the wingers, with Westbrook and Brad Walker in central midfield, and in Hardy and Kennedy are the duo up front. But they're not quite the deadly duo of Broger and Nelson, who started nine of that ten-game run we just talked about. Let's get into it. We've got Laurent on the bench, so you might get a first glimpse at him on camera. Aside from that, it's what you would expect. Matt Foy even gets a place on the bench today due to our injuries and sold strikers. Let's get into it and see what we can do. An attacking 4-2-3-1 for Plymouth. It's going to make it a tough game, but we're going to tell the lads to pick up where they left off. It was a brilliant performance against Peterborough. Probably the only good performance in the last five or six games. So we're going to encourage the lads, see if they can do the same again. Home Park looks absolutely packed for Plymouth. There's loads of fans in the stand there. They might even get 10,000 for this one. As Walker goes back to burn from the kickoff, we play the long ball over the top. Kennedy remarkably wins the flick on, and Wooten nearly runs it out for a corner for them. What I was about to say is we're not going to win those aerial duels anymore, because we haven't got a big man up there. They're basically two advanced forwards or poachers, but one of them's having to play in a pressing role, and they're having to be target men too. But we've scored early doors. It's gone in 
in off Kennedy, I think. It's not. It's an own goal from Wooten. And what a start to the game he's had. He nearly ran a simple pass out for a corner in the first minute. And in the second highlight, he puts one in his own net. We're 1-0 up. And you can ignore all the negativity. I have no idea how we're still plucking these results out of thin air. But we'll happily take them. And we'll continue as long as we can get results. We'll be up in that top half. And we'll be delighted with our first season back in the Football League. Hume with a long ball over the top, which Kennedy chases down the channel. Of course, it does give us a little bit of extra pace up front with him, although Broger was fairly quick himself. Walker gets the ball out to the left of Tom Walker. Brad Walker to Tom Walker is all a bit confusing. Freeman comes in at the back post. A lovely cross by Walker, but he's headed over the bar. But despite that, we've not had a shot on target and still lead 1-0. There's a weird set of facts for you. Tom Walker on the left-hand side gets it inside to Brad Walker, his namesake. Gets it over the top for Hardy, who's in one-on-one. -on -one, and that is an awful finish. Nelson and Broger wouldn't be missing those. And Cooper gets the goal kick, who hits it long to Purrington. Ness in midfield to Lemiras. What a ball over the top that is, but Pike intercepts. Westbrook goes long and Hardy's in again. They're really struggling with our pace up there. Kennedy's got a runner. It finds Tom Walker. It was unintentional. He was trying to be greedy, but luckily it deflected out to him. Walker's got the ball in again, but he's headed away by Ness. And Lemirez can bring it away. Ryan Taylor over the top, but he's got no pace at all. He's a big target man and won't get there. Hardy on the end of a long ball over the top. He's a great save by Cooper. And it's behind for a corner. And we've got another chance to increase our lead as it comes in. Davis knocks it down for Kennedy and it's blocked behind again. And it's going to be our second corner in quick succession. But this time it's an outswinger from the opposite flank. Tom Walker to take it. Towards the back post, it's over everyone apart from Purrington who heads away. He gets it away to Lemiras, who comes over the left-hand side on halfway. Switches the ball up towards Ness, but the highlight ends and it's still 1-0 with just 10 minutes to half-time. Pike takes the throw in towards Freeman, but he's challenged very quickly by Purrington. I don't know if that's the same Purrington who used to be a left-back for them. It was a youngster coming through a few year backs on Football Manager. I don't know that he was ever a central midfielder, though, so we'll check that out at the end. Brad Walker knocks a header down, but it falls to them on halfway. They've got the ball with Lemiraz again, who's playing in that number 10 role. Tom Walker wins the interception, but it goes straight back to him. He shoots from the edge of the box, but it's comfortably over the bar, and they still haven't had a shot on target. They've got an in-swinging corner with the same man again, though. Taylor's up. It deflects a couple of times. Purrington gets the last touch, but it's blocked off the line. And now on the counter, it's Macau Kennedy. A lovely switch of play to Freeman, and now it's four on five. Freeman gets the ball in towards Kennedy again, but he's headed away. Westbrook on the edge finds Tom Walker. Back across goal, but it's blocked again. And it's finally away from Plymouth. And there's still remarkably only been one shot on target in the match. It's a free kick for Plymouth in the centre circle. Lemiraz gets it from the centre half Wooten, who's at fault for the fact they're behind now. Lemiraz goes back to Ness 25 yards out. Purrington in the middle again to Ness. They're just playing it between the two of them. They've got a switch on if they want it, but they haven't used it yet. Ness finally does go out to Moore at right back. He gives it away to Walker, and maybe that's why they were so reluctant. Kennedy beats the centre half to it down the left flank. Crosses for Hardy, puts it in the bottom corner. And I tell you what, I might have underrated this front too. They very much look like a a football league side at the minute and they very much look like a football league partnership they could be our saviors they could even be better than broger and nelson that's how the optimism changes in just five minutes of a save we're on the stroke of half time and if we can hold on to the break at 2-0 it'd be absolutely brilliant but Moore cuts it back to graham they're in the area it's a great challenge by aaron davis had to be careful on a yellow but got there kennedy's in on the left now hardy's unmarked in the middle it falls for him off a wooden deflection and hardy puts it in it's 3-0 just before the half time whistle and again scott wooden inadvertently deflects across that was going to the middle of nowhere into the path of Hardy who scores an absolutely dreadful half for Scott Wooten but a wonderful one for us at Torquay United and we lead 3-0 at rivals Plymouth let's go and tell the lads we're proud of what they're doing we have been 3-0 up and let it slip twice this season already so hopefully we won't do that this time and we'll keep very close eyes on what they're doing particularly in terms of their mentality off the pitch it's a throw in on the left for Plymouth. We're just over five minutes into the half now. Taylor tries to get the flick on, but Bass is there to claim it. He's been really steady for us this season. I know a few people fell in love with Jamie Jones towards the end of the last year, especially in that playoff semi-final against Wrexham, where he had the game of his life. And I tell you what, he wasn't bad for Wickham against us earlier in the season. But it is progress. Bass is a 22-year-old. He's developing so quickly at the same rate Jamie Jones was decreasing as a player. So he's going to be an absolute star for us. And another one we've got to watch out for because he's going to attract interest as we move forward. Walker with a big clearance. We're not talking about Plymouth attacks because they're not really leading to anything at the moment. 
Tom Walker's got an in-swinging free kick. It's just over the bar. It just nestled the net, but unfortunately it was the wrong side of the crossbar. And on the hour mark, it's still 3-0, and we'll think about substitutes in a minute. To corner to Plymouth, Jamie Ness delivers and Davis again wins it to flick away. I remember after the first episode, we came into the Checker Trade Trophy game in episode two and I said, I don't know that Davis is the solution. We're going to play Platt and Davis is just there to make up the numbers in the cups. And he has proven me so wrong. He's been absolutely brilliant for us and he's given me no choice but to play him in the first team. We've got another corner with Tom Walker now, an in-swinger. So the back post, which is lost out, and Sarsavich clears, and Moore knocks it away. We had another warning somewhere. Ryan Taylor to be man-marked by Johnny Byrne. Another big lad marking the target man. And we've just got to see things out professionally now. Just under 20 minutes left. Cooper with a goal kick for Plymouth. Up towards Ryan Taylor, who knocks it down this time. We've got a warning to close down Moore, the right fullback this time. Ness gets it to Sarsavage out to Graham. Graham's going to take on the fullback, is he, and try and deliver. Finds Taylor. It's a good header, but it's straight at Bass. Though I'm a little upset Johnny Byrne wasn't winning the header there. 15 minutes left. Let's make some subs. There's two standout performers who are below a seven, so we're going to have to take those off. Freeman replaced by Kiwamia, just to add a little bit of pace on the wing. And Westbrook's going to be replaced by Phillips, the more defensive of the two central midfield replacements. We've also got Davis on a yellow, so I'm not going to take a risk. I very rarely sub centre-halves during the game, but we don't want to risk a red. He's had one already this year, so Platt comes on for him, and hopefully he'll be less unhappy if he gets some minutes on the pitch. Just over 10 minutes to go, and we're comfortably 3-0 up, and hopefully we'll see out the game. Within a minute of coming on, Platt's got his yellow card, but we've got a long throw now with Hume. It's headed away back to him again. Hardy with a shot from the edge. Hume again to Kennedy. Knocks it down for Tom Walker, just over the bar, and it's still 3-0. You could tell Hardy didn't take the best option there. He was so desperate to get his hat trick, but unfortunately it wasn't to be. Well, we haven't had another highlight. We're nearly four minutes into the three added on at the end of the match, and Hardy's headed away a corner, and we're just waiting for the whistle. What a professional away performance. Away to your rivals, and they did exactly what we did earlier in the season. They completely bottled it in front of their own fans. A massive gate in for it, but our away fans will be happy. We're going to sing the praises of the lads who were so good in that game. And I tell you what, I might have to eat my words about this front two. Joe Hardy, the man of the match. Sensational performance and two good finishes. And Mikel Kennedy with two assists as well. We're up into seventh place. The first time in the year we're in the playoffs. After 15 odd games we were sat in the relegation zone and we were worrying about our job because our new board had come in and had told us that we needed to improve and they weren't judging us on the past seasons. Look at us now, if they'd have sacked us they would have seemed so silly and it would have been a very hasty decision. We've got Wimbledon up next, powered by Barley Mumba, so I've no doubt we'll lose that one. But it's lovely to have been up there for one game only. And more importantly, we're now clear of 50 points and we're certainly going to be in the league next season. Still only 9 points separating us down to 18th, as teams seem to keep winning down there. We'll go and quickly look at what they've said about the game. Hardy fires us into the promotion hunt. No he doesn't, don't talk about the P word. We've done it two seasons in a row, and we're going to fade away now we've lost our stars. We can't cope with a promotion to League One. It would just go absolutely all wrong if we did that. We haven't got the squad to cope, and we would finish bottom with a humiliating total. So we've only got one thing left for this episode. We're hopeful that before next week's game, we're going to get our first ever youth intake at Torquay. So we'll see you in a second for that. Right, we're back. It's the match day, but we've had our youth intake. So that's what we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this episode. It doesn't look like a particularly good one. When you get this player stands out as one of the better players from this year's youth intake, it's normally the worst message you can get. I'm very surprised they couldn't stretch to the message about it being one of our best youth intakes in years because we haven't had one for two years since we've been here so it was going to be our best in at least three campaigns. But it is such a big step for us just to have youth players coming in, to have a youth team, a youth recruitment policy and we will work it up now. It's where we're going to be spending a lot of our money. I'm not one who goes out for the big transfers. You've seen already, I like to get freeze and bargains that our scouts pick up and then sell them on for bigger money in the future as you'd get in real life. The only stage I want to get to is the one where I'm in charge of what the fee is rather than the board because they keep selling them for peanuts. But let's go and have a look at the team. It is a big first step for the club and I tell you what, one of them's not that bad. I know it's a goalkeeper, but that's almost the perfect situation. If you can get a future sub or third choice keeper who you can always have on the bench as that seventh man because he's homegrown, it's the thing we don't have at the moment. So for the rest of the season, this 15-year-old keeper's going to be on the subs bench. Let's put them in potential order. He's a sweeper keeper by trade. If we look at his stats, he's got awful handling. Oh, he's got awful composure. 
Awful positioning. Oh, it's not good. It's really not good. He's got great reflexes and he's good at rushing out, as you would expect for a sweeper keeper. There's something we can work on there. An unambitious personality isn't ideal, so we'll try and get him working with Bass. But hopefully long term, he'll be good enough to be a second or third choice at the club. The next one along the list is Nigel Potts. He's the only other one with more than two star potential. He's one star at the moment of 15. A left winger, only in the attacking midfield role. Something we don't use too much. A temperamental personality this time. Similar to what we have with Dungannon in the head coach. We've got players with awful personalities all over the place. I tell you what though, this lad doesn't look too bad across the board. He's got eights and nines in certain positions. Seven for vision. It's not too bad at all. He's fairly quick. He's got good natural fitness. The only concern for me is that he's a right footer only. I don't mind if a left winger isn't entirely left footed, but to not be able to use it at all is a bit of a worry. But again, he may get the odd game on the bench. We're here to give young players as many opportunities as possible, because long term I want a team of homegrown players who the fans can be proud of, and it makes it more rewarding for me when I get success if they're players that we've developed from the age of 15 or 16. The only other two that have got one star ability already, and ones that we could potentially use this year, are Ross Dix, a right back, a no-nonsense fullback at that. He's a decent tackler, fairly good physically, and look at him mentally. I tell you what, for a 16-year-old, 17 determination, 19 bravery, and 15 teamwork, and he's someone I wouldn't be afraid to throw in for the odd game. He does argue with officials though, so a little bit of a concern there. The only other one we had that was one star ability is Leon Morgan, a number 10 so he doesn't really fit into the way we play and doesn't have any more potential weirdly, which is a bit of a shame because he looks a fairly good player aside from that. He's unambitious but he's got all of his stats in the right areas and if he had room for improvement he could have been a real star. It might just be that our coaches have misjudged him and he has got ability to improve. So we're going to give him a chance as well just to see if he can develop over the course of the season. I have no doubt that because of the fact we have no one here in our youth team at the moment that all of them will get signed on and get their opportunity. But as the years go on and our youth recruitment improves, as we start to bring in finances and develop the club off the pitch, we will get to be a bit more picky about who stays and goes. But a lovely note to end the episode on after a really disappointing start. Let's go and look at the schedule for when we'll be back. Obviously it does largely depend on whether we're still in playoff contention. I haven't quite decided whether I'm going to do one or two more episodes this season yet. So you'll see in the next game we'll either come back around the start of April for Northampton who are right up there. Or we'll come back on the last day of the season for Notts County who are currently the side at the bottom of that mid-table pack. But either way, I was coming into this episode with a real negative and a chip on my shoulder about Broger. But it has ended up being quite a positive video overall. A fantastic result against our rivals. Finally an away win after a few games off on the road. Joe Hardy, the lone signing that replaced Broger, coming to the fore with a brace and a fantastic performance. And a youth intake with a couple of decent players. But most importantly, the fact that we've just got our own developed players in the club. So if you did enjoy this episode, please put a thumbs up on it. Let me know in the comments what you think of the series so far. Where do you think we'll finish in the Football League? And what did you think of our first ever youth intake at Torquay United? Subscribe to the channel for daily Football Manager content from my two FM19 stories. This one part of the furniture, as well as my other series, The Head Coach, where we work under a director of football with no say in transfers or contracts. Which is basically what this one's turned into when we get an offer for a young player, because the board are making the decisions here too. But a massive thanks for watching this one as always, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>